Hello and welcome to the 17th episode of the Shameless Picture Show. That's kind of crazy to think. We've done 17 of these. Look at us! Not necessarily all together, but there have been 17 (laughs) episodes with the title of the Shameless Picture Show. Uh, Anyways, I'm Michael Vyers, and with me, as always, is the man that taught me. If you want to f*** with the Eagles, you've got to learn to fly. Nick Richards. That was my favorite one thus far. Yeah, that was good. (laughs) Uh, today's episode is one I'm really excited for. It's the episode where we discuss Heathers. Heathers. Now, is, oh, continue. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll hit you after your, All right. your intro. Heathers, directed by Michael Lehman from a script drafted by Daniel Waters, tells the story of young Veronica Sawyer and the agony of being in high school. Veronica is a member of a very elitist, color-coordinated sect of popular girls aptly named the Heathers, based on the fact that all of their names are Heather. Except for Veronica. They never address that. Uh, Veronica is blasé about it all and unhappy, that is, until she meets the very mysterious Jason Dean. Jason Dean is, as Veronica describes, a dark horse in the running. He's not the typical kind of guy with his looks, his interests, and the fact that he's probably a sociopath. Ever, after accidentally killing the head of the Heathers and disguising it as a suicide, Veronica and JD head down a dark road of killing for the sake of making their high school a better place. This very dark comedy stars Winona Ryder, Christian Slater, Shannon Doherty, Lizanne Falk, and Kim Walker, and was released by New World Pictures in 1988. Three blind mice, three blind mice. Heather Chandler, Heather McNamara, Heather Duke, Veronica Sawyer. Why are you such a mega brat? Because I can be. The most powerful clique at Westerberg. Not Veronica, drool much? Most people would die to get into it. Heather number one, just look right at me. I'm worshipped Westerberg, and I'm only a junior. Veronica would kill to get out of it. You were nothing before you met me. You were a Girl Scout cookie. JD has come to answer her prayers. I'm a no rest build up man myself. We'll kill her. He's got a way with women. <laughs> Away with words. Is this as good for you as it is for me? Life can suck! And a very special way with a gun. Veronica can't live with him. Now! I love my dead gay son. And she can't live without him. Does this turn out weak or what? I had at least 70 more people at my funeral. What? Their meeting was destiny. Ah. Take out her tonsils? Their love has a body count. I loved you. I was coming up here to kill you. That's it. We're breaking up. Young love. Heather's a killer comedy. I'm going to have to send my SAT scores to San Quentin instead of Stanford. So, I know that you've established previously that this is one of your favorite films. Yes. Is it your f- number one favorite, or where, where do you think it lies in the running? That's, that's I know hard. it's hard to well, sta- it, say definitively. It's ma- mainly hard to say because like, I've always gone through life just saying that Halloween is my favorite film because it's the one that kind of sparked me to go to film school and all that fun shit. Uh, but every time I re like I don't know every time I rewatch either like I, I rewatch four movies and they always are kind of butting head for first place. So if I could just do a, a four way tie with the, my first place <laughs> film, it'd be John Carpenter's Halloween, Michael Wieman's Heather's, Tim Burton's Ed Wood, or Brian De Palma's Blowout. But I I'd say at the moment Heather's is my favorite movie. Because that's the one that you watched most recently. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I could definitely see this film being one that I'd get something more out of each time I watch it. Yeah. Which it, which automatically um, gets a lot of bonus points for me. It means that there's a lot of depth to the film, uh, that, that it's interesting. There's also a lot of depth to the film. If I death can, and depth. If I can add that dumb joke. <laughs> uh, so, Nick, this is your first time seeing Heathers. Yes. And it's one that I, I feel like I harp on everyone to watch. Because it's also, it's weird because it's definitely got its cult status. <clears throat> but it's still a relatively, 
I'd even say go as far as say unknown film. There's a lot of people who don't know it, and um, <clears throat> and I really thought when Mean Girls came out that that was gonna um, re- revitalize interest in this film because the Mark Waters who directed Mean Girls is the brother of Daniel Waters who wrote <laughs> Heather's, and Tina okay. F- Tina Fey wrote Mean Girls as her tribute to her love for Heather's. Nice. Um, so I was really hoping I was gonna like because I saw this movie when I was a kid. Uh, my mom was watching it, and. I don't remember be like I don't remember a whole lot about it then. I just remember thinking some it was just a really goofy, funny movie. I didn't don't remember any of the subplot about suicide or any of that stuff. Right. But um, no, it's like you said, it's one that every time I watch, I find something new I like. And um, yeah, what did you think of it though? Um, it <clears throat> it caught me off guard a little bit. I I've always heard it talked about in context with the Breakfast Club yeah. and. Uh, I had, like, a Weird Science and all of those, like, classic late 80s, early 90s, like, suburb comedies. Um, did we just, did you just create a subgenre? Because I've never heard that before, suburb Sub- comedy. <laughs> I've never heard of it either, but I assume I'd never have any original thoughts, so. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, so the first half made sense. Like, I was expecting the, the Mean Girls-esque social structure stuff yeah um when it turned into like a bonnie and clyde like (laughs) a serial murder film like that that was it caught me off guard um i found like i said i found it really interesting Uh, i'm looking forward to watching it again and picking up on on other things i think there's a lot in there that i didn't pick up on like i understood the the narrative but i think there's a lot of depth to to explore yeah, um, the dialogue is friggin' amazing, um, <laughs> <laughs> and it it's definitely my kind of weird. Like, yeah. it's the the kind where like there's there's a flow of what happens in the story that your first reaction is what, why, but then you go back and you're like, okay, like I see what you did there. And yeah. So. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was a winner for me. Um, I don't think that it like inspired a reassessment of my top ten by any means. That's fair. Um, but but I got a lot out of it. I enjoyed it. And it's one of those movies that I just I feel like I just saw at the right time, and that's why sure. it adds so high up on my my list because um, I like I saw it when I was a kid, and I thought, oh, this movie's kind of fun, and then for, I hadn't thought about it. In years, <clears throat> and it wasn't until high school that they re-released it on DVD for the first time in God knows how long, and it might even might even been the first time on DVD. But I remember uh, thinking, "Oh, this is that movie my mom liked," and I said to <laughs> I remember like buying it. It's like, "Mom, remember that movie Heather's you liked?" And she's like, "Kind of." <laughs> <laughs> like for some reason, it stuck out to me way more than it stuck out to her. As, it was one of her favorite movies. Oh yeah. I th- think i remember that <laughs> yeah it's like and um i uh, was like well i bought it and like i so i rediscovered it in high school and i just became obsessed with it i had the same feeling when i when i watched heather's i guess it's technically for the second time but it felt like for the first time um yeah. in high school that i had when i watched the lost boys for the first time where i just became obsessed with it and i was like i just want to watch it again and over the years i've just i've tried to read everything i can about it to the point where like where i've read so much about it that i'm just hearing the same stories over and over again <laughs> and uh and i'm like i i've read two different versions of the script over the time i read the actual shooting script and i read uh uh, Daniel Waters' original like three-hour version of the film, <laughs> uh, which is a story behind that, which we can touch on in a little bit. But um, okay, you mentioned um, the 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 Hughes uh, trip tech yep. earlier on with the uh, you know uh, sixteen candles, Breakfast Club, Pretty in Pink, which um, this film was written to be the antithesis of those. Okay. Like he, uh, he, Daniel Waters says now it's like, he's like watching like Breakfast Club now. And it's like, I'll sit there and be like, wow, this is actually a pretty great movie. But he was like 21, 22 years old when he wrote this film. He's working in a video store 
in in California, and he's you know he says I was a pretentious film nerd. So when Breakfast Club came out, he's like I wanted nothing to do with it. I was like this isn't accurate to my my version of high school. <laughs> and I guess Heather's isn't either, but. What? <laughs> That's well, hilarious. It could like, be. Everybody's running around murdering people and passing it off as suicide. Well, That's what happens in my high school. Well, it's 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 interesting because he uh, he says that he had his finger on the pulse a little more with the people at his high school because uh, he, he, I love this. His name was Daniel Waters, and he wrote an article for their school paper called Troubled Waters. <laughs> I just love that. But anyways, it's where he took essentially stories of the of his classmates changed the names and published them and it was huge nice. um but his biggest issue so like he kind of had his finger to like w- teenage issues and then that plus the fact that he said his biggest issue with the hughes films and it's actually my biggest issue with them as well is the fact that all of these kids problems always comes down to blaming their parents sure all oh, my life would be so much better if, I, if my parents weren't in the way it's like parents were the enemy and he said, that's, you know, he's like, I've never felt that. So he's like, I just, you know, I don't get why that is always the, the, the seminal issue. These kids never blame themselves. They blame their parents for their issues. So he said, I wanted to make a movie that wasn't that. It's funny because both of the two or main characters, they do, while, while the characters themselves never blame the parents, the film presents the parents at, still as flawed and flawed to a point that it affected the kids i see i didn't view it that way well, maybe 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 uh maybe jd's dad he seemed a little <laughs> strange uh I, that he blew up his wife yeah like in a and then but still loves blowing things like that definitely made jd yeah, the that, sociopath that he was yet he never blamed his father right the the film connects it, yeah. but that character doesn't. And then uh, uh, Veronica's mo- pa- uh, parents are really interesting because like the dad is just like gone. Like I yeah, can't even I can't even figure out a word to say that. Uh, the the way that they have those scenes where it, like it's the exact same dialogue. Yep, framed exactly the same. Day. Yep. Um, again, the film makes a connection that that the. The parents are part of this problem. I mean, why introduce the parent characters at all? They're trying to show that her environment has shaped her into what is causing her to do this in some degree. But, as you said, um, Winona Ryder's character never says, oh, my parents are are never there for me. And, they're, you know, it never does that, which no, is good. And actually what I love, too, about... Uh, the Winona Ryder's mom in this movie is like, for anything, at, near the end of the film, she kind of snaps back at her and gives her like, you know, this is how the world works. And I was <laughs> like, I'm glad they did that. You know, yeah. give that character a little bit of a spine. Um, uh, so uh, we got your initial initial thoughts. And like, um, one thing I feel like it's worth mentioning with this film is that uh, this is a fir- th- this is a first film in a, in a lot of ways. Michael Lehman he came right out of UFC to direct this film. He did like uh, he did a couple shorts while in USC, but this is his first movie. Denise Denovi, who produced it, went on to later on produce with Tim Burton. This was her first pr- pr- uh, producing role, and then Daniel Waters. This is his first screenplay. He w- later went on to do Batman Returns. Um, uh, I think uh, Hudson Hawk. He did a couple other ones, <clears throat> uh, and then he later on went on to direct a a vampire movie of his brother called Vampire Academy, which I haven't seen. But, <clears throat> um, it's, but someday, yeah. Uh, it, but I, I just thought it was interesting the fact that this is a first film for all of them, and like I feel like that's part of the reason why it has so much edge because they had something they're trying to say. Yeah, um, they all were trying to prove themselves. Michael Lehman was trying to prove himself to be a very competent director, and later on went, would uh, go on to do some of the better episodes of the television show True Blood. Denise Denovi obviously went on with Tim Burton and Daniel Waters. Like he's still writing and everything. It just like I feel like he's the one who just he got the short end of the stick a little bit, and it could be because some of the controversy behind this film and the fact that the film was not much of a success. New World Pictures essentially went out of business right after this film came out 
Uh, if they they said if they would have finished the film a week later, it would never have come out. Huh. Wow. It's the hands of fate, man. Yeah, it's it's kind of <laughs> crazy. And um, like uh, I was reading recently that Winona Ryder, for example, she really wanted to do this film. Like, uh, but it's, Daniel Waters didn't want her originally. Uh, and he just said he didn't think she was pretty enough to play this role, and he wanted Jennifer <laughs> Connelly instead. Okay. Which I find really amusing, but she was, like, willing to do anything to get the role, uh, work for practically nothing. Uh, uh, Christian Slater was a bit of a star at this point, so, like, him being, like, it's it just seemed like serendipity that everything came together. Winona Ryder had just done Beetlejuice, but I don't think, it hadn't come out yet. She went to the Beetlejuice premiere while on set for Heather's, so okay. like she hadn't gotten like she had done a couple other uh, little films, but Beetlejuice and Heather's are really the two is the one two punch that shot her into stardom. Right. So she really had to rally to get this part. Nice. So I don't know, just giving you unnecessary context. <laughs> no, very necessary. <laughs> it, 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 if we didn't talk about the context of the films we watched, then this would be a very short and boring podcast. <laughs> Probably. And um, what I was saying earlier about the three-hour version of this film, which I was reading, it's it's funny to re- read through it and see what has all stayed and what hasn't. Um, and uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, he had written, uh, Daniel Waters had written this movie to be... To essentially be directed by um, Stanley Kubrick, that's what he saw in his brain. Was he saw this as like he's like he's done his horror picture, he's done his war picture, he's done his his uh, his, his old timey drama. This could be his high school film. This <laughs> this is his uh, suburb comedy. <laughs> yeah, and like uh, I I I would have loved to uh, I would have loved to seen like what. Kubrick would have done with it, and actually to the point where, like, and Michael Lehman kind of internalized the Kubrick thing, and they lit a lot of scenes like Full Metal Jacket. Yeah, to... some of the camera moves I could also see uh, being a, a re- reference to that. Yeah, and just like the way that um, the fact that Christian Slater just felt like a lot like Jack Nicholson, which he has said was not like an intentional thing. That's just how he talks. He just sounds a lot like Jack Nicholson. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, the script, the three-hour script is really, is it's it's a lot wordier, and not even just in the dialogue, but in the descriptions. Um, and here's one of my all-time favorite uh, descriptions of a character. It's introducing Heather Chandler, who is the we, the main Heather. Okay. And this is her descriptor, and I love this. The content of what Heather says is consistently offensive, but the tone in which she speaks is sexy, dangerous, and mysterious. She is a mythic... <laughs> and you get everything you need to know about that character <laughs> yep. from that sentence. I thought that was that was fantastic. <laughs> so, Nick, I feel like I've been bogarting a lot of this conversation of just background information. What do you want to talk about with, in um, terms of Heather's? I think... Uh, and I was telling you before we started recording, uh, typically I take notes also, but uh, the morning that I was watching this, my two-year-old son was crawling all over me, preventing me from taking notes. Jerk. Um, and I know, right? And uh, I think like the pattern is, obviously when you're seeing a film for the first time, it's more of an, you're, you're still absorbing the material. Yeah. So it's when, when you're re-watching something for the fifth or sixth time, then... Like, it's always easier for me to, like, all right, here's all the bulleted topics that I want to discuss. Um, so I have a couple of just quick things that I'll throw in there, things that caught my eye that entertained me. Gotcha. Um, and then one bigger topic that Ooh. will probably spur something more. Um, so first is Winona Ryder's diary writing monocle. <laughs> it's even in the script too, which I love. Like it was a, it, in both versions of the script, that fucking monocle is there. I love little stuff like that. When I was trying to get actors for Normal, one of them, one of the actors that ended up being on it, she said, "Normally, 
I don't take smaller roles. Like, I've gotten to a point oh. in my career. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, she had gotten to a point in her career. Well, there, real where, quick, there are no small yeah. roles. There are just small actors. <laughs> right. Teeny tiny actors. Um, <laughs> for, for this kind of indie project. Yeah. And uh, with, with little to no pay and that kind of, like, there's no reason for her to come on set yeah. for no pay for a five minute role in something that's probably not gonna advance her career at all. She said specifically that the reason why she took it and that she wanted to be a part of it, no matter what, was the scene where their um, the character Bruce and T- Taylor are in the van they had just picked up the protagonist and they're driving and it's an introduction of these two characters and and after his first line picking them up you see Bruce in the driver's seat and he's eating a grapefruit but he's eating it like you would an apple <laughs> so he <laughs> just peeled that. it away and he's just like you know taking big bites of this unsegmented grapefruit oh. and she said that that was what she thought was so great that the, that the script in general interested her, but it was moments like that that made her want to be a part of it so bad. And that was that monocle for me. That was that, like... It shows the writers... Like, creativity is too broad of a term. Like, demented spe- specificity yeah. that, that I want... That I try and have when I write. No, and I do, I do, I do stuff like all, like that too, where it's like I'll come up with a weird little detail that just needs to be in scene. Like, um, I, I wrote a slasher film a couple of years ago, and uh, I was very adamant about having a hula girl on the dashboard. Yeah, for no reason. Uh, and sometimes <laughs> it's funny how these things come come to be. Where so a lot, of, sometimes it is in fact the writer who came up with the monocle or something. But then you've got like, have you seen uh, Valley Girl? No. With Nicolas Cage, it's one of another one of my favorite comedies of all time. Uh, <laughs> Nicolas Cage was homeless at the time when he did this movie. It was like really early on in his career. <laughs> he was living in his car. <laughs> and uh, down by the river. Yeah, probably. From what I've heard. You're using your paper not for writing, but for rolling doobies. You're going to be doing a lot of doobie rolling when you're living in a van down by the river. Uh, and uh, this is L.A., so he'd probably, like, you know, after she finished shooting, drive on down the Sunset Boulevard, check out some concert, fall asleep in his car, and just show up to wherever set was tomorrow. And they had no phone. He had no phone, so no way to contact him. So every day it was like, please let him be here. <laughs> um, and every day he'd come to set with a box, a box full of that he wanted to include in the scene. He, he, so he'd look at the director and say, can I use this? No, that one doesn't work. Can I use this? <laughs> and, like, <laughs> my favorite one, because uh, it wasn't in the script, He's he works at a movie theater. And he's snapping tickets and everything. He's got a pair of 3D glasses on. <laughs> and a guy comes up to him and asks him. And uh, apparently this was an ad lib and they just kept it. He's like, oh, is this movie in 3D? And he goes, no, but your face is. Oh, bitch, and is this in 3D? No, but your face is. Oh, like, I hate 3D. Can you see it? It's not in 3D. <laughs> Have a nice flight. <laughs> and that was all just because he he wanted to wear those 3D glasses. Most of his right. out, most of his clothes he wore in it were just things he found, and he thought it'd be funny to wear. That's awesome. I love like it can be a problem when the actor's vision is really starkly different than the director's, but when you have an actor that interested in giving the character complexity in a way that does work with the vision of everybody else it's so rewarding yeah um not that nicholas cage is anything to do with heathers i just thought it was a it was a pretty great story <laughs> it's a great anecdote yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> something else that that i appreciated was so there's the scene where winona Ryder shoves the car cigarette lighter into her hand <laughs> and then christian slater lights a cigarette on it on the burn on real quick and, and not because of like the misogynistic aspects i just thought the idea of like lo- someone lighting a cigarette off of their hand was so cool when i was in high school as dumb as it is and it makes no sense it, high school <laughs> oh. me just thought it's like oh that's cool 
<laughs> oh man, I wish I could be as cool as that guy. <laughs> Lighted my cigarette off of open flesh wounds. <laughs> yeah, I thought that um, was cool. <laughs> but I, I really liked at the end when Christian Slater blows himself up. That the explosion then in turn lights her cigarette. Yeah, that's another scene I thought was super cool of him just putting his arms out. It was a callback yeah. to that. Yeah, I, I was like, I high school me was just watching it going, he's so cool. <laughs> and like, I watch it now, it is like, it just felt like some like someone had written like the most stereotypical cool character ever, and it fucking worked on me. <laughs> <laughs> it it charmed you. There was even um, a moment, moment where I was like, I wonder if I could wear a wife beater and a trench coat together. <laughs> you totally pull it off, bro. <laughs> um, I, one of the lines that interested me the most that I would like to, on subsequent watches, really dive into and analyze is when the hippie teacher says... Um, whether to kill yourself or not is one of the most important decisions a teenager can make. That line just kills me. It it really is this not a time for troubled youth. <laughs> it it's a kind of the the main point of this larger topic that I'll segue into now of the using teen suicide as a criticism of of high school and and adolescence and um that suburban morality structure and um that that i think that line could be a big window into what they were trying to say with all of that that i haven't quite gotten my head around on upon this first watch i know it's uh daniel waters has actually said that like he didn't because like this film got so much for uh in the 80s for being a pro suicide movie and he's like that was not at all my intent no yeah. <laughs> it's like my intent was very obviously an anti-suicide <laughs> film <laughs> he's like i just wanted to present it in a really goofy way and it's it's interesting especially well, that's oh, a problem it's a problem with using satire mm -hmm. um because if people take it at face value then they're not going to get it then no. it will be misinterpreted no exactly and like i thought it, especially in the 80s it was such a bold idea to take a very serious topic like the idea of of suicide uh and present it in a comedic fashion, like, and especially with the, all the uproar recently with that new Netflix show, 13 Reasons Why, yeah. which is a very uh, dour depiction of of adolescence and suicide. It, it dives deep into it. Uh, I thought it was I thought it was interesting how they can present. Uh, I'm not going to say those the same I, same themes, but like how they can tackle a similar subject in a very radically different yeah more entertaining way honestly <laughs> like i just watched the trailer for 13 reasons why and said yeah, i'm not watching this this looks depressing <laughs> i watched uh i think the first four episodes my wife watched the whole series um my wife hated I, it by the way i and i think i forgot to ask her both my wife and i were very concerned with the protagonist's uh, motivations That's why she's making the tape like what is her mind state as she approaches that moment when she's making all of these tapes and does that make sense and i think the whole story needed to play out before that would be revealed whether or not it ended up making sense so but at the as of the point that I stopped watching, it's still like I it wasn't sitting well with me. Yeah, I think it didn't make sense for that character. I don't remember if my wife watched it all, but she just uh, did not like the depiction of it. And um, but yet had no problem with Heather's because I feel like Heather's is not taking itself very seriously. No, it's it's using it as um, I get to as a way to satirically look at other things and and. You know, again, send an anti-suicide message. And it, it's well, one thing that really intrigued me about Heather's was like how the idea of suicide quickly became associated with the popular kids. And when Martha Dunstock tried killing herself unsuccessfully, and you know um, Heather McNamara, which is Shannon Doherty's character, uh, I 
Heather Duke. Sorry, I I used to know them all. Like I I know which Heather is which. Uh, she um uh was like essentially criticizing her it's like look at her trying to be like one of the popular kids it's like why is suicide a popular thing to do right and then like the whole you know jd i think said at one point in the film that you know heather chandler is more popular dead than she was alive right that that all of the characters that did it suddenly took on a very different meaning to all of the other people Mm -hmm. like like they're who they were as a living person was in complete contrast to who they were as a dead person. Yeah, like it's fun. Like they, they're, they're the the notes that Veronica and JD wrote gave these characters more depth than they ever had. Yeah, that wasn't even written by them. <laughs> yeah. So and and there's something to be said for what those letters and how they were received what they say about Winona Ryder's character mm-hmm. um, also something real quick uh, you mentioned how um, Winona Ryder had just finished filming Beetlejuice and there's the other connection to Beetlejuice through the character that played the the efficient oh my the god funerals. why can't I think of his name I, cause uh, I love this actor yeah <laughs> oh, hold on hold on I got it, I got it. it's a Glenn Shaddix not so fast, brown boy. We're gonna have some laughs. Also, <laughs> he was great. He started out playing it so Eskimo like, level, uh, uh, but then yeah, by the time you hit that dream sequence in the end, like it's. It's the character. It's more like the character that I knew from Beetlejuice, which was fantastic. Mm-hmm. And it's the whole Eskimo thing is funny to me because like I've always been interested to go through my copy of Moby Dick and find out if the word Eskimo is even said in there. I don't think it is. But okay. what's interesting to note is Moby Dick was not the original choice for that book. Okay. It originally, it was going to be Catcher in the Rye that she was going to be obsessed with, which would have made more sense with the it's story. It's more literal, yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> apparently, originally they actually had passages passages directly from Catching the Ride they were reading from, and uh, Daniel Waters said it made a lot more sense, but uh, Salinger would not give them the rights to use it. Oh, okay. So he swapped it to Moby Dick, and he's like, he's he says in the commentary, he's like, it works. It doesn't work well, but yeah. it works. <laughs> it's a little more wedged in. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but no, Glenn Shaddix's character, and then like how weird those dream sequences got, where they're all like, you know, wearing the 3D glasses, and they got the big inflatable uh, um, plants. Could not think of that word. Um, uh, and then I just love like when uh, Heather Chandler's fixing her hair with the holy water. Yeah, totally. And she's like, I had probably 40 more people at my funeral. <laughs> No, I just I I thought like I I don't want to say this movie's realistic because like even like in its in its reality it's very stylized cuz uh they they were trying to pick clothing options and and dialogue options that didn't date itself too much so they were trying to like they're trying to pick clothing that like people aren't wearing this right now. Yeah. Like uh well, and and trying to make up their own dialogue make make up their own slang as not to date the film super yeah. super much. It, I didn't get that same reaction I had to watching Lost Boys for the first time, where it was like, wow, this is such a, like, you, you can tell exactly when that movie was made. Yeah. Like, at no point watching Heathers was I like, oh, boy, that doesn't hold up as well now, or, you know, it was more universal. Yeah. So I, I, I always thought that was really cool, that they, he just really wanted... He he didn't want, for example, like if for us to watch him and just be stuck on the fact that this is the '80s. He like he was thinking for the future, a little bit, and you know, and that's why we have such great, you know, this is such great dialogue. Like two of my favorites are uh, 
uh, fuck me gently with the chainsaw because yeah, I, I say that near almost like I, f- I feel like once a week I find a way to work that into conversation <laughs> and people just look at me funny and then uh, sw- Swatch Dogs and Diet Coke heads just killed me. Okay, I missed that one. <laughs> yeah, she's she's writing her diary very passionately and she's like, I'm, her monocle. Yeah, I'm surrounded by Swatch Dogs and Diet Coke heads. <laughs> Awesome. And I was like, oh, you rock. I like you. <laughs> the one thing I've not been able to figure out, though, is um, the obsession with croquet. Because <laughs> it seems like right. such a weird sport. And I feel like Daniel Waters might have talked about it at some point. I just don't remember, like, why croquet? That strikes me as another one of those, like, monocle choices. Yeah. Right? And, is that, and again, if I, that's what that should be referred I, to is now as a monocle choice. Right. Um, the, if I continue the parallel with my film, um, like how they're playing Scrabble throughout my film, there's not really a strong reason for it, but it gives it an interesting landscape to set a scene with. No, and, I, you know, and I think it, it spoke to their their upper class white suburban lifestyle. Or maybe they're like me, and they're just a nerd for details. Like if I'm writing a script, and I could like, you know, two characters, Nick and Michael, are sitting are s- sitting playing a game. Do I just want to say playing a game, or do I just want to pick a game arbitrarily, just because it's a <laughs> you, detail? You totally want to pick a game arbitrarily, or yeah, like yeah, pick like, something out. Make make it as so long as it adds to the scene. It doesn't have to add anything specific, but it has to help give it all dimension. And I think that's what those little silly things do, um, is is give dimension and life and breath yeah. to a film. Like, for example, I wrote a script not too long ago where a character works at the comic book shop and someone comes in and asks for the very famous Green Arrow comic where Speedy's got the needle, the heroin needle sticking out his arm. Why? Just because I think that cover's funny as hell. You're right. So yeah. I wrote that comic into the story just because Absolutely. I think it's funny as hell. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that, continue. That's our that's our prerogative as writers. Yeah, Just, it makes me laugh. It's going in the <laughs> script. Um, all right, so I, we got the big topic of suicide and um, out of the way. I was going to ask you your opinions, and you you know you, this movie's new for you, but you yep. know you know you know it was written in 1988. Uh, do you see the tremors of this film in pop in in films since? Because this film, this is the film that launched a thousand ships, where it went on to inspire a lot of other filmmakers. Okay. And I'm just, I was curious to like if you were noticing any of them. Like you're like, um, oh, this feels like this film. I wonder if they were inspired by it. And right. Um, I think, you know, it. I'm. I tend to be a little hesitant to pin a single point as a branch off Mm -hmm. because I'm sure that Heather's is a point from some other films branch. Like everything is inspired by some, by a range of other things to some degree. Yeah. Um, So I like, I tend to like just get a little wary about getting too specific about how this film influenced all these others. Um, Though kind of what, what, I, some of my thoughts on that is, like, I, I mentioned that I loved the dialogue. Yeah. And it's the same kind of appreciation that I have for the dialogue in the Kevin Smith films. Yep. Um, and it's the same kind of dialogue that I try and write. Um, very pop culture laden and... Kind of wordy. Rippy, kind of wordy yeah, at times, wordy, too. Wordy. That, that not every sentence has to be absolutely meaningful but it still adds something it's it's not there to fall flat and do nothing um the you know i i saw the the connection to um like i said uh, the weird science pretty in pink 16 candles films uh, a lot of it cinematically mm-hmm. and the 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 subjects age race income level you know um you you could make many connections to 
tackling such a dark um, topic in a very light, almost sarcastic way. You know that mm-hmm. you can see see that throughout. Though again, I don't know that I'd be so quick to say, "Oh, that's because Heather's did it first. No, but, that's fair. But I was I was more so like not necessarily like all oh, the like I, I guess just like. If you feel like Heather's in its own weird way, its own cult way, if it if it worked its way into pop culture, whether people know it or not, absolutely through, through people being inspired. Um, I'll I'll point to something that uh, my wife and I have seen like five million times: uh, Gilmore Girls, which is very. Mm-hmm. <laughs> pop culture laden um but there are several references to heathers within gilmore girls and um you don't need to know heathers in order to appreciate what's being said like there's there's a point where um lorelei tells rory oh you're the new heather because she takes the place as the popular girl Mm -hmm. suddenly in in her grade school um or middle school and uh, that was actually a line from the show yeah. Wow. Yep. You're the new Heather. Wow. <laughs> and I'm I'm pretty sure uh, Rory at one point uh, says, "What's your damage, Heather?" Also, when somebody bangs into her at at school. I've uh, I've said that as well. Yeah. Uh, What's your damage, Heather? And uh, I also say it's very. <laughs> and I will also from now on be saying, "Fuck me gently with a chainsaw." Because <laughs> it's it's you can work it into any situation. It's so good. <laughs> like I wanted, I want someone to say it at my funeral one day. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm gonna say at your funeral? Well, I'll be a ghost and I'll be saying I had like 40 more people at mine. <laughs> uh, as it should be, Nick. As it should be. I guess the reason the the reason I wanted to ask this question was because when I saw this film in high school, uh, it was I saw it right before. Jason Reitman's Juno came out. Okay. And I just remember, like, drawing parallels, not necessarily in story, but just, like, the vibe. Yeah, I could see that. I, I saw Juno when it came out. Obviously, I hadn't seen Heathers to make the connection, and because I only saw Juno once, I don't remember enough of it to mm-hmm. be able to go back, but... If I ever do get the chance to see Juno again, I'll definitely be looking for it. It would be a very on the nose double feature, but uh, yeah, uh, right. I think it would not always a bad thing. No, not but... not always a bad thing. It's just uh, two very radical views on high school um, presented like just presented in very different ways. Juno just it, to me, it feels like the love child of um, Heather's and every Wes Anderson film. Right. Specifically, I guess, right. earlier stuff like Bottle Rocket and whatnot, but that's what it feels uh, like to me. Um, and where uh, Heather's takes on teen suicide, Juno takes on teen pregnancy. Yeah. So, there's definitely parallels there. Um, hold on, I had, I had something I wanted to mention, but I completely uh, lost it. That's never good. Like when you have like a point you want to make, and it suddenly seems much more poignant once it's gone. <laughs> yeah, it it does. It, it was probably nothing. Oh, uh, um, <laughs> one thing I um I I really uh, I was amused by was uh, hold on, what was her name? Heather Graham was originally yeah. gonna play the lead Heather, which really? I, I love. Yeah, Heather Graham was was really interested in doing it, but her mother didn't want her to do it because she thought the material too was too scandalous. However, <laughs> she went on later on to play uh, like a heroin addict, like a year later or so. So like apparently that's fine. Mom came around. <laughs> um, but this one I love, and I would have, I would have loved to see how they how this would have played out. Brad Pitt almost got the role for JD. Interesting. But they thought he came across too nice. Like, you know, speaking of on the nose, I think Christian Slater is the on the nose choice. Yeah. But Brad Pitt has obviously proven himself as a very dynamic 
actor. Now, whether or not he could have pulled it off when he was younger, I don't know. But I have no reason to believe that he wouldn't have brought something very interesting to the role. Yeah, I would have loved to see how, like, just think think about this original casting. Jennifer Connelly was originally going to be Veronica. So for those of you listening who don't know Jennifer Connelly, she was in Labyrinth and uh, Dario Argento's Phenomenon, a.k.a. Creepers. Uh, uh, and the, uh, the Darren Aronofsky film that still has darkened my soul. Um, God, what is that one? Requiem for a Dream? Yeah. Yep. That one, that one haunts my nightmares. It haunts everyone's nightmares. And it, it's a great film. I'll never watch it again. Yeah, understandable. <laughs> uh, so Brad Pitt was going to play JD, so that's just a very interesting one-two punch. And then uh, Heather Graham was originally going to play the original Heather. Uh, however, what's interesting, how you said Christian Slater was the more on-the-nose choice. Yeah. Um, he got that role because he was dating Kim Walker, who played the lead Heather. <laughs> and um, Lizanne Falk, who played the other Heather, you know, the one that no one seems to care about as much because she's just kind of there. I'll, I'll quote Mean Girls because she's such. Sh- damn, I fed it up. Edit. And by that I mean don't edit. Um, nobody ever remembers her because she's such a slut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, she. I didn't know this until I uh, until I was listening to the commentary, but like apparently Daniel Waters was really interested, like obsessed with with Lizanne Falk because he was she she wrote a book that he was really into called cause she used to be a model before okay. she was an actress. It was called Lizanne, a, a young model, and he was just obsessed with like this this, this girl who wrote a book about be, being a model and just like how scandalous it was so he was like when he saw her name on the call, call sheet he's like Lizanne Fox auditioning can we just give nice. her the role <laughs> so he, she got that role because like he was like super into the book and um nice. and this really re, re, this really rings true when you see the movie read a script and everything you can tell that um Daniel Waters was a sucker for pop culture like yeah. and not just like he watched a lot of movies, but he was into like he said he wrote the reason that Veronica has her really crazy journal entries because she said she he was obsessed with the idea of the girl book is what what he what he called okay. it the book you know that's written from the perspective of a young high schooler talking about her, her issues in high school. He said they were really popular in the 80s and the 70s, and he was really obsessed with those types of books. So he wanted to make his version of it. So having uh, Winona Ryder narrate the entire film, right? Uh, as 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 if this is her girl book. Nice. So, Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't really know where to where to come from that, but. <laughs> yeah. No. I, um... I I think that was a good discussion. Do uh, you want to branch off into anything else? Um, not unless you you feel like uh, anything you want. You were telling me earlier about um, some stuff that you're you're doing through work. If you want to promote yourself a little bit. Oh, um, sure, yeah. So, um, I work for a foundation, the Avalon Foundation, woo. and woo woo. Uh, <laughs> And we run an annual arts festival um, for outdoor uh, painting from life. Uh, and that style is called plein air. So um, we run the biggest outdoor painting festival in the nation, plein air Easton. And I, I think it's, the, it's either the 13th or 14th year. Um, and so that's coming up. That's why I've, I've been so busy lately. Um, I don't know. Uh, you and I have had trouble getting this episode scheduled. Yes. We had a couple of, like, plan Bs, but I'm glad we got to record this. Um, even though I've been so busy, um, whether it was me recording, you, you offered, well, I'll just record another solo episode so that we can get this, you know, so that we don't fall behind. But... It was really important to me to make sure that I wasn't absent like three episodes in a row. Yeah. Um, because this podcast is important to me. Oh. Well. So if you want to give so, but oh, but Planet Easton, it's gonna be huge. I'm putting a lot of uh, I'll be putting a lot of video clips up um, 
through Facebook and YouTube if you want to check it out, see what's happening. A lot of really beautiful paintings are going to happen. A lot of really cool artists are going to be here. They're just fun to hang out with and talk to. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I'll be doing for the next two weeks. Nick, why don't you promote yourself? Names, dates, locations. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I am terrible at self-promotion. Thank you for whipping me into shape. Um, it takes place in Easton, Maryland. Um, I believe the official kickoff is this either Friday or Saturday, the 14th or 15th, and goes through until Sunday the 23rd. Um, That's a long time. It is a very long festival, and that doesn't include the pre-festival stuff. <laughs> there's a there's a paint out that happens before that. Um, paint out. A lot That's of little cute. things. <laughs> yeah. Basically, the streets of Easton are like filled with painters for over a week. Um, you can walk around, talk to the artists, and see what they're doing. There's a lot of structured events for for kids and for people that are just like consider themselves artists or art fans. Um, it's a really cool event. Times are, you know, always over that week. Uh, you can go to plannereaston.com. You can go to avalonfoundation.org. Find us on Facebook. Uh, that's where you can see all the videos. Or if you find the MCTV YouTube page, Midshore Community Television, not only can you find all of the Plan Air videos that I'll be posting, but also the TV versions of the Shameless Picture Show podcast. Woo! Which I've heard is doing pretty good on your YouTube page. Not too shabby. We're like... Uh, for our YouTube page, uh, Shameless is the second most popular show. Yeah, and it's probably mostly because of me. I keep refreshing. <laughs> that That's awesome. Uh, uh, second only to Talbot Rising, which is our local political show. Well, that's understandable. Um, yeah. You should do me a favor. Okay. Uh, when you are at this, this painting festival, just very nonchalantly walk up to one of the artists and, you know, just strike up a conversation with them. And then just say to them, so if you ever see a red door, do you want to paint it black? And just see how pissed off they get. <laughs> Look really serious yeah. when I say it. Oh. Like I'm really interested in their answer. <laughs> yeah. And see if they get it, because that'd be funny. <laughs> that'd be funny if they didn't. <laughs> I will try and do that. <laughs> Thank you. It'd be even better if you just recorded it while it was happening, too. And then start going bump 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 bump. Uh, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> um, I guess for me, I don't really have a whole lot going on uh, because I had just finished my tenure with Troma Entertainment as one of their their editors. Uh, my newest video was just posted. It was uh, has such a long title. I think it's um, filming film your own damn nude shower scene with Ophelia Rain, who is a goth porn star. Nice. Uh, it's edited on YouTube, but if you have the Troma Now app, you can watch all the boobs for free. <laughs> well, not free. It's like $3, $3.99 a month, but whatever. Uh, so I was editing for them for like four years. I started with them shortly before, or, or uh, yeah, a little bit before I met my wife. I think I did maybe one or two videos before I met her for the first time. Uh, okay. And I just realized, man, I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> I need to. I, I should. I should move on a little bit. And uh, since then, I've I've booked a music video that I'm going to be shooting. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, we got like underwater. We got like underwater slow motion cameras. What? So it's like we're going to do some weird stuff <laughs> with these cameras. Very cool. Um, and you know, just trying to get things made. Um, however, I forgot. There's an, an integral part to this episode that I completely forgot. Okay. Um, a friend of mine named Stephen. Ah, yes. A friend of mine named Stephen Millick. Millick? Millick? He's gonna he's gonna correct me later on. <laughs> um, he and his 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 good friend Christopher Kai House they run a film festival here in Milwaukee called the Twisted Dreams Film Festival. To my knowledge, it is the first successful uh, genre film festival, and just mainly because there's no other ones around, and they've lasted for two. Oh, they're going on the third year, so. There you go. Uh, it was a really cool <laughs> festival. I, I got them involved with Trauma the first year where Lloyd uh, recorded some fun incident, like pre-show, like turn off your cell phone videos for them. Yeah. And got them the rights to the show, the midnight movie, Blood Sucking Freaks. <laughs> so I helped them out with that. And then the second year, they, they debuted my newest film, Do You Love Me? 
So they're a bunch of good dudes. Well, even awesome. anyway, Stephen Millick, he just crossed Heather's off his own personal shame list because with the intent of writing something about the correlation between Heather's and 13 Reasons Why. Oh, okay. Right. He recorded a little audio thingy for us telling us talking about his his opinion his thoughts on heathers so we're going to play that for you right now awesome Let's see if i can get it to work thanks guys for inviting me on to talk about the movie heathers this movie has been on my shameless for a while and it, even before i knew you guys were going to do a show on it i decided to put it on uh, netflix and actually watch it so i went into this movie not really knowing what to expect for good things about it but you know, that could always be tossed up to people feeling nostalgic when you see a movie as a kid, build this uh, idea that it's the greatest movie ever up in your head, but sometimes those movies don't hold up over time. Kind of half expected it to just be a cheesy 80s teen drama film, you know, kind of after school special type of thing, but it turns out it was completely wrong. It was a really great film. When Owen Wright and Christian Slater kind of top of the game in this one. And the story is different enough from any other teen movies that even today it still feels uh, fresh. Uh, I knew from talking to people that the movie was kind of a dark tale in high school, but I really wasn't prepared on how dark or violent it really got. I kept waiting for it to back off a little or kind of more play it for laughs, but I kept going and pushed it pretty far. You know, like I said, high school's movies are always a product at times. And there's no denying that this takes place in the 80s. It's very obvious about that. But uh, the stories about uh, people struggling to be popular or being bullied are always going to be timeless stories. So you can uh, really get that feeling that, like, they tap into something, like this experience in high school that a lot of people have. And while they can't really relate to these characters because they're kind of outrageous characters, but it makes them that feeling that it taps into you makes the movie kind of feel honest and a little bit relatable. Um, but, and you can really see this influence in uh, later movies, especially movies like Mean Girls, which Mike had pointed out to me that has a direct connection to Heather, so it wasn't something I was imagining while I was watching it. But this movie stands on its own, and I can't think of any other movie quite like it. Overall, it's a great flick. It's a great acting and a smart story that isn't afraid to go to the dark side of uh, high school uh, storytelling. Um, and thanks again for having me on. And I hope you guys have a great rest of the show. I'm looking forward to uh, listening to it when it's published. Thanks. Bye. So, yeah. Nice. It looks like he, he had the similar opinion as you did. I, I was, my whole time listening to that, I'm like... I, he said much more concisely and intelligently what I have been babbling about this whole time. It, 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 he shared my opinion nearly to the letter, but said it very, very much gooder. -er. If it makes you feel better, that was his second take. Okay, it, it that said, does make me feel said, better. Heather's two. So I imagine the first one might have been like an hour long, just like ours. Because I'm rolling live. <laughs> yeah. I might not even edit this, just to yeah. just to show how live we are. <laughs> We're the two live crew up in here. Uh, Shameless picture show I'm, with two live crew, Mike and Nick. I am so white. Yeah, I am too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for providing uh, that that contribution to this conversation that was awesome and i i, I love stuff like that like i loved when you talked to your mom for the mother's day <laughs> yeah. going with the wind episode i wish it would have I been a little that. bit longer but yeah i loved that too <laughs> um so i i would love to do stuff like that more often me too so if any of you like if any of you uh notice that something we're talking about is something you've just seen for the first time let us know record something he, i think he just recorded that on his phone we'll play it we we like hearing we like knowing other people are listening. <laughs> you too can also be just as famous as Nick and Michael. Because right now, he's going to be on the YouTube show. That is the big leagues, people. <laughs> Mystery Science Theater started That's on public right. access. Rem remember That's that. Right. Uh, so... Uh, Joy of Painting with Bob Ross. That's that's public access. And that's on Netflix. Both shows right? are on Netflix. Netflix is next. One of them. It's next. Got rebooted. Nextflix. Yeah. And it ain't Bob Ross. Right? 
Just saying. <laughs> the one that we all thought was gonna it was gonna happen. It wasn't him. So, uh, my coworker and I one day were um, fa- found this like five public access TV shows that you didn't know you were missing in your life or something like that. Was it, was one of them the Red Green show? No, but that is a good show. I totally know exactly <laughs> yes, what you're referring to. Um, <laughs> oh, I used Canada. to watch that back to back with Red Dwarf on PBS when I was a, in high school. <laughs> yep. Um, anyway, yep. Uh, one of them was clearly like a Bob Ross inspired show where this guy is painting and doing painting ex- instruction, except the two things that made it different is one, he was in a suit and tie the whole time, no, and two, okay. he was running on a treadmill the entire time. <laughs> so of course he's getting paint all over his suit while he's painting oh and, it, and explaining what it is that he's doing. And then after he painted the picture, he then went and attempted to hot glue popsicle sticks into a castle. And because he was running on the treadmill, kept burning his fingers so badly. <laughs> oh my! And this is an ongoing show. I, I don't know if it's still on a public access show, but it can be found online. I, I will try and find the name of it and include it on our Facebook oh my God. page. That, if the, if that could sustain more than one episode, that's yeah. impressive. Yeah, no, it was it was a an ongoing series, <laughs> to the best wow. of my knowledge. Well, next, the Shameless Picture Show is going to be on that. And then, if we ever get around to making the DVDs, we'll eventually be for rent yes. yep. in Chicago. So, we are all over the country, not just Woo! in one state. <laughs> you can see us on television in Maryland. You can listen to us everywhere. And you can watch us and on the And you can the rent YouTubes. us in Chicago. <laughs> and the YouTubes, yeah. So, uh, this has been a pretty good yeah, episode. Yeah, I think next. so. Uh, do we have a topic for next time, or are we going to stew on I it I think we'll bit? stew on it for a little bit. Um, though we have mentioned recently both Taxi Driver and Apocalypse Now, which I think would both be uh, good to tackle soon. Yeah, let's go. Let's let's go from let's go from the you know light topic as uh, of teenage suicide, then go to war, and so you know being a taxi driver. <laughs> I don't really know what that movie's about. <laughs> Yep. I haven't seen it's, it. It's If you've seen the TV show Taxi, they're pretty much the same thing. That's kind of what they're I figured. They're both about taxis. The yeah, and like a mohawk? Yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, I just know his name is Travis Bickle <laughs> with rhymes of Dick Trickle. <laughs> and he's a race car driver. I'm not sure what to do with my hands. <laughs> Um, I don't really know how to how to end this, Nick. Well, that would be consistent so just... with what we have done for the last such scene. <laughs> <Yes>. episodes. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! Listen, going on being consistent with the last couple episodes, we're not going to end yet because I need to mention um, you will not be here next Correct. week. So just so no one's expecting another double don't. episode with both of us, I'm going to have to go solo again. I'll probably I'll probably you know make my wife come and talk to me. She doesn't like talking to me, but I, I'll, I'll convince her to do it. Uh, we'll probably do something together. I have a couple of topics in mind. Nick is going to be busy uh, as, yeah, and asking uh, artists if they paint things red doors black, black. <laughs> uh, or ask if they can paint on a treadmill. That'd be cool. Uh, yeah, an instructional video. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be alone next week, but it'll be fun. One is the loneliest one. I thought you were going to keep talking, so that became much more focused on my singing than I intended it to be. <laughs> I saw your mouth opening. I was just like, I'm going to yep, stop that's right the, now the, and make him. Two. It's not I, I as bad as it. one. It's the lowest. Anyways. Since the number one. Um, now, if, uh, oh, oh, if only I can convince my bosses to let me edit this show at my there job. You go. Because I've got a feat ahead of me to get this edited before it goes up <laughs> Tom- tomorrow. Um, right under the but buzzer. it'll be fun. Yeah, is that it, a, it, what, it might. What the sports say? Yep, that's why I have never established a time, just a day. Yep. You have until eleven fifty nine. Yep. But anyways, I think now we're done. I think we are. Well, as always. It was a real pleasure, and talking film with you is one of the highlights of my bi week. I'll take <laughs> every that. Is one of the highlights of my every other week. 
Mine too. And this was a really great film, and it's another example of why I'm grateful for the show, because uh, as you can see on our Facebook page, my shameless is very long and only gets bigger by the day, and because of this, I'm able to start making some serious progress, checking them off and seeing some of these great films. Yep. And uh, actually, uh, I don't know if any of our listeners listen. Uh, use the app Letterboxd. But what I was going to what on Letterboxd, you can keep track of lists of movies that you've seen or movies you want to see. I was going to, whenever I have the time, <laughs> to sit down and make two, make three lists. One of Nick's Shameless, one of mine, and then one of everything we've watched. Oh, that sounds so that great. way you can... You can keep track of it at home. And what's nice about Letterbox is you can select an option that will gray out anything that you've seen. Ah. So that way you can kind of work your way through the list with us. That sounds us. great. I'm looking forward to that. Cool. I'll let you know when that's up, and I'll post links on the Facebooks. All right. But, all right, Nick, you have a good bye week. Yes, um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your next solo episode. I always enjoy those. Did you listen to the last one? Because I felt like I was just, I feel like I was rambling a little bit, but they all kind of. I are. did not, but it is, the, but ah. it is the only episode that I have not listened to. So, that's fair. Yeah, I, well, I, I always I have to listen to every episode because I had to. Yeah, right. <laughs> Normally, I take the weekend to catch up on that, uh, but this last weekend was my birthday, and um, my one day party Yay. kind of turned into like a three day crazy, uh, like just cool weekend that. Cool guys playing D and D. Yeah, and and card games yeah. and old school video games. I I made sure that my NES and my SNES were hooked up and working and played some. I'm really bummed out that like the the SNES Classic is coming mm, out. Yeah, and well, I'm not bummed out about that, <laughs> but I'm bummed out that they have like all the, the the some of the rarest games on the SNES they have available on there, like Super Mario RPG, Final yeah. Fantasy three, things that like cost you eighty dollars for just the cartridge and the problem is like me and the missus we we were thinking about getting the switch and we can't afford the switch and the snes right. classic so here sophie's like, choice i guess i'm yeah i it's granted i could just get that like level of intensity <laughs> yeah like i granted i could get uh emulators but it's not, yeah, the same. not the same but we've said goodbye three times now i think that's always our our, that's our, the our goal that's the magic number yeah all right, all right. dude have a good one have Everybody at home, watch Heathers. Let us know what you think. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>